Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are doing well. It's good to see your faces bright and early. <laughs> um, we're going to get started here in just a minute. And I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to grab these items from around your house. If you haven't already compiled them, if you don't have a printer, you are welcome to draw the paper helicopter. I tried to, if you can see that. Ooh, my space background. So, as we get going here, I just want to share the slide that um, the handouts are available uh, at the bit.ly on your screen. And today's webinar survey, um, if you can make sure you copy and paste that um, from your chat or you make a note of it, um, we really appreciate you filling out the surveys. It helps secure funding uh, to continue these wonderful webinars. So make sure. Oh yeah, and I see somebody taking a picture with their phone of this screen. That's a great way to capture the links. So go ahead and take a minute to do that. And I wanted to introduce my friend Lori Bone with the Longway Planetarium. Hi, Lori. Hey, everybody. <laughs> we had her uh, around the state, can you believe it was fall of 2018 when we were doing a universe of stories and the NASA at my library science kits. So I was so excited to have Lori come back and join us uh, today for this motion webinar. And then we have another webinar with Lori coming up in a couple of weeks on um, STEM in the kitchen. So thank you, Lori, so much for being here. And thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for sponsoring this. Lori, I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to um, do this webinar. Um, unlike all of you, I am um, in the process of scattering, trying to figure out how we're going to approach this new normal. I'm sure you all have it under control. We don't even, uh, even a little bit. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to get our programs um, into the virtual sphere and um, how best to serve our families. Um, we're missing our families terribly, as I'm sure you are too. Um, so thanks to Kathy for reaching out and giving us this opportunity to um, practice our new format. So today we are going to, um, we're, we're going to look into motion. Um, the objective for today, uh, for this webinar, is, to sh is for me to share some standards-based activities with you that um, will help you link to what kids are doing in their classrooms. Um, in science. These are easy activities that you can either share virtually or you can do when we do when we are able to get back face to face. So um, the activities that I've chosen are ones that are materials that are fairly easy to get um, and um, really cheap. So I would like to give a brief overview of the next generation science standards for forces in motion, um, just so that you have a little background as to where, where this content is coming from. And I'm also going to provide a brief um, overview of some science background around the concepts of forces in motion. Um, and then I have activities. What we did was do, uh, we made some YouTube videos of demonstrations of these activities. So I will introduce the short video, um, we'll watch it together, and then we'll have um, a brief amount of time for um, discussion so we can think about how best to use them. Um, I do need to thank Katie Bancroft and our staff. She was the one who video um, used the iPad to, to make the video and she also edited it for me. Um, so I really appreciate that. And a shout out to my daughter, Sarah, who I made run with the kites and teased about her Crocs. So you'll see about that when we get there. Um, so every one of these activities, the, the, the four areas that we're going to talk about today have um, activity sheets that we've developed to go along with them. Those are in a Google Drive that Kathy has shared with you. So you'll have access to all those write-ups as well as the YouTube links so that you can come back to and rewatch if you need to. Um, and the uh, template for the helicopter. So, um, with and Laurie, I just want to remind everybody if they're able to share their camera that you want it to see their faces today and their projects. <laughs> it's so hard to just talk to the computer screen. All right. So 
I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and let me make sure I'm in the right place. So this is um, just a, a little document I put together for um, from the Net Next Generation Science Standards. Now, um, I don't know how familiar you are with, with these standards, so very quickly I'm just going to run through how they're, they're set up. Um, so forces in motion ends up in kindergarten and third grade um, is where those standards fall. These science standards are set up in three foundation boxes. So the first one is science and engineering practices, as you can see in kind of this dark salmon color and the darker blue. Science and engineering practices are the how to do science. The disciplinary core ideas are the what. Okay, they're kind of the meat and potatoes, what the content is. And then the cross-cutting concepts are big ideas that transfer all across all grades and all disciplines of science. Um, so they're just the big general ideas. So you can see in kindergarten for forces in motion in the science and engineering practices, they're focusing on planning and conducting investigations in collaboration with peers. And they're also starting to analyze data from tests to determine if, if um, their object or tool worked the way they expected it to. Um, it, the DCIs for kindergarten talk about pushes and pulls having different strengths and direction. Uh, it also talks about the fact that pushing and pulling on an object can change the speed or direction of its motion and stop it or start it. Um, when objects touch or collide, they push on one another and a bigger push or pull um, makes things speed up or slow down more quickly. And over here is the cause of uh, the cross-cutting concepts is cause and effect. Okay, so simple tests can be designed um, to gather evidence to support or refute student ideas about causes. Causes and effects come down to if-then statements. If I do this, then that happens. Um, so third grade, you can see in the science and engineering practices, they're getting into planning, conducting investigations collaboratively to produce data to serve as a basis for evidence. So this science and engineering practice is really starting to call them into um, developing tests, fair tests that control variables. Um, and again, making observations and measurements that produce data to serve as evidence. Um, so for the discipl disciplinary core ideas for third grade, they're really starting to break down into um, forces acting on a particular object, reiterating the fact that there's strength and direction. Um, and it starts to get into balanced and unbalanced forces. And also it talks about the fact that if I watch motion over and over and over again, and I start to see patterns, I can use those patterns to predict future motion. And the cross cutting concepts talk about patterns and again, cause and effect, okay? So as we're working through these activities, these are the places where they support classroom instruction. Again, those are gonna fall into kindergarten and third grade. Okay. So before we go any farther, I would like to show you these as well. Um, let's do motion hunt. Um, these are the activity sheets that are in that Google Drive file or folder that, that'll be shared with you. Motion hunt is our first activity. Um, when you carefully observe the world around you, you'll be surprised at how much motion you can see. This is just a motion scavenger hunt. I do invite families to have a paper and pencil around so that they can record and start thinking about how they can organize the information that they see so that they can communicate it with other people. Um, the book list that I used, I pulled these from your, um, uh, the Michigan Electronic Library. Uh, catalog. These were really great books. I really did enjoy them and, and you can get to them through there. Um, so in this think about about this box, we're asking kids, I'm asking kids when I do this with kids, I ask them to start using words to, to describe motion. Um, and again, we're looking at motion in speed and in direction. Um, I ask kids if they've learned a new word, um, as they're describing motion, and I ask them to teach me a new word. Yes, I already know what fast means, but if a kindergartner can tell that to me, that's fantastic. I wonder if they could make up their own word. I mean, what does whoosh look like um, when they're trying to explain how something's moving? 
I also ask them if they're able to measure motion. Um, do they have any tools that can help them measure? How far did it go? How fast did it go? Um, how long did it take something to move from one point to another? In the procedure box for this activity, um, it just made some suggestions as to things that, that families can think about while they're going on their motion hunt. Um, things like um, what objects in motion are easy to spot. As I sat in my office um, in my house, I was able to look out my window and through the trees I can see I-75 and I can see a little semi-trailer going by every now and then. Um, there were some things that were easy to spot and there were some things that I really had to look for. Um, I asked kids to sit still and observe very carefully. I wondered if there were any very tiny motions that they could find. Um, and describing the motion, anything that you can think of that um, invites kids to change motion, um, again, that if then statement, if I do this, how does the motion change? Um, can they find something that's moving and make it stop? Can they find something that stopped and make it move? Can they find things that have um, wheels that make things easier to move or slide down a ramp? Um, can they find something that's really hard to move? And I did link in this YouTube video from the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. They moved an enormous uh, submarine into a basement and uh, built the gallery around it. It's a great video. It's a time lapse. Um, so I, I thought it was really interesting. I also wondered if kids could hear things moving. Um, and it, it, what are some of the things that you wonder about when you see things move? When I see a bird fly, I wonder if the bird actually has to think about flying. Or is it one of those things like us walking where we just don't even think about it? I don't know, some of the things that I thought about. All right, so that's the way these activities are put together on these sheets. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this share and we're going to come back to this in a minute. All right. How are we feeling so far? Can, can you give me a thumbs up if we're good so far? Brilliant. Thanks so much. This is complicated to do. All right. Um, so let's go through some background, some science background really quickly. Um, motion is just a change in position. Okay. And again, it's a, it's a vector quantity. So if you want to um, amaze people at the dinner table tonight, tell them that motion is a vector quantity because it's measured in two dimensions. Okay. We measure it in speed and we measure it in distance. Um, it's not a scalar thing where there's only one thing to measure. Um, so by changing motion, what that looks like, it can speed up, it can slow down, it can stop, and it can change directions. Okay. In order to change motion, you've got to apply a force. A force is just a push or a pull. Any kindergartner I ask, what's a force? And they go, mm, and then they say, it's a, it's a push, right? And, and it's a pull. Um, every object has forces working on it all the time, even if it's just sitting still. So for example, I have, a, I have an ink pen and I'm gonna tip my, my camera down here. I hope you can see this. Where am I at here? I'm going to put my pen on the table. Okay, so this pen, even though it's sitting still, has forces acting on it, right? It's got gravity pulling down, and it has the table pushing up. Now, right now, these forces are balanced. The amount of gravity pulling down is the same amount as the gravity pushing up. If it wasn't, it would be moving. In order for this pen to move, there has to be an outside force or an unbalanced force in order to change the motion. So I have to apply push like that, okay? That's an example of Newton's first law of motion, which states that objects at rest stay at rest and objects in motion stay in motion, okay? If that's complicated, don't sweat it, because here it is. Objects in, at rest stay at rest. If I put the pen on the table and I set it down, it stays at rest, unless it's acted on by an outside force, okay? Objects in motion stay in motion, unless they acted on by an outside force. That's a little more complicated because that says if I take this pen and throw it as hard as I can, it'll keep going forever and ever and ever. We know that's not true, okay? If I throw this pen, are there other forces that are working on it to slow it down, okay? Gravity's pulling down, the air resistance as the, as the pen is moving through the air, and then of course, when it hits the floor, that normal force from the floor pushing up stops it as well, okay? Now, 
why don't we go ahead and um, take a look at the kites video. Um, I did invite you to get materials if you wanted to play along. Now, I did this before realizing that the video may move a little too quickly. If it does, don't sweat it. You can always come back and do it again. Um, we ended up having to um, edit these down quite a bit. I'm, I'm quite sure I have too much material for today. I'm sure anyone who knows me is like, can't believe that's the case, but it's true. Um, so let's go ahead and watch this video. Go ahead and play along if you'd like to. Um, a quick note about the helicopter. If you don't have a printer or if you couldn't get it to print off, don't, don't sweat it. We're gonna, you can just use a half a sheet of paper and um, at the end, after we watch the video, I'll show you how to cut one really quickly. It doesn't take a second, doesn't have to be perfect, okay? Let's watch this video. Okay, let me find the video. We're on your... Um drive screen. Yeah, I put it there so that I would have the link. How strange. Okay. <laughs> That's what you get when you there just you go. know you've got it under control. Here we go. Okay. And we don't have sound. Thank you. Let me fix that. Supply list, Good big God, idea, a book list, and a procedure for making each of the kites, a written procedure. For our first kite, this is our B kite, and you are going to need a sheet of paper. Any old paper will do, eight and a half by 11. You're gonna need a little bit of tape, and you're gonna need some type of string. You're gonna fold the paper in half short ways, kind of hamburger fold, and make a crease like that. Now, you're going to take one of the corners and you're going to fold it back to the crease and you're going to be about two and a half inches down from the top, okay? Now, it's very important that you don't fold this crease. You want a loop right here for the air to move through. If you have a stapler, you can staple that right there. If you don't have access to a stapler, just grab a piece of tape and tape it down. Again, don't crease that side. You're gonna flip this over and you're gonna do the same thing on this side. You're just gonna match those points up right there and tape it down. If you'd like to reinforce the hole where you're going to tie your string, you can take a piece of tape and just fold it over the center crease like that. Okay, so we're going to take a pair of scissors or a hole puncher or something to make a hole, maybe a pen or a pencil, um, and we're going to very carefully put a hole through this paper. Um, might be a good place to ask for adult help. So I just made a little hole, and I, I'm going to choose the kite string, I think, this nice light string. to add to my kite. And I'm just gonna tie that through. Like that. And that's a done kite. Why do you think the, flight, the kite stays in the air when Sarah's running? Let's talk about the forces of flight. Well, when I buy the kite, I hold on to the string. Is gravity still pulled down on the kite? When I get the kite in the air, does gravity stop working? Why does it stay in the air? Gravity is always pulling down towards the center of the earth, right? Gravity never stops. Gravity is a pull force that pulls everything towards the center of the earth. Now, like any um, flying object, gravity pulls down, there must be a force that pushes up. And that force is called lift. And I'm gonna draw that with a blue arrow. That force is lift. Let me give you an example of lift. I take the sheet of paper and I pinch it with my thumb and fingers at the top, like this, and I roll it back 
And I put it just underneath my lip, my bottom lip, like I'm playing a flute. Watch what happens when I blow hard on it. Do you see it moving up? This is an example of Bernoulli's principle of lift. Daniel Bernoulli was a Swedish physicist and he discovered that faster moving fluids have less pressure. Air is, is a type of fluid. So as I blow air across the top of the paper, it's faster moving and so there's less air pressure on the top of the paper. If there's less air pressure on the top, what does it make the air pressure under here? Makes it higher, doesn't it? Low air pressure here, high air pressure here. And that air is able to push that piece of paper up. We've also got wind. Wind is moving in this direction. Now I've got another word for this. I'm gonna call that wind drag. The other word I'm gonna call for or call it is air resistance. Okay? Air is not nothing. There are molecules of gas that are in the way, and in order for this kite to move through the air, the air molecules have to move out of the way. Um, so that air pushes back on the kite. If it's so windy, why doesn't it just keep moving backwards, 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 backwards? That's because the pull from the string, and we're going to call that force tension. So we have gravity pulling down, we have lift pushing up, we have drag pushing back, we have that tension from the string pulling forward. If there's greater gravity than lift, the kite will just fall down. If there's more lift than gravity, the kite will fly. What if there's more wind resistance, air resistance, than tension from the uh, string? Let's say it's a super windy day and you're not paying attention and you let go of that string. What direction is the kite gonna go in? It'll get pushed right back a little bit, okay? All right, let's go ahead and make our second kites. For this kite, you're gonna need a sheet of paper, straw, some tape, string to fly it with, and you're going to need some kind of material for its tail. You're going to take the paper, fold it in half, again, short waist or hamburger fold. Okay. Now this is kind of tricky. Okay, so here's the crease. You're going to take this top corner and you're going to fold this back at a diagonal, okay? So at the top of the kite, you're gonna fold this right back to the crease. At the bottom of the kite, you're gonna have about three fingers width from the bottom so that you're folding this at a diagonal. When you've done that side, you can flip this over, here's the bottom crease, and you can fold the other side over to match this side, crease it. The widest part across is the top of the kite. The narrowest part is the bottom. You're gonna use a straw as a brace across the top of the kite. So take your straw, lay it across the widest part of the, of the kite, and tape it down. On the back side, the side with the bottom crease, again, we're gonna use some tape to reinforce the hole that we're gonna make, and we're gonna come down about three inches. Where you place the hole does matter. If it's too far back here, the kite won't fly very well. It does need to be just about three inches down. Fold the tape over the crease to reinforce the hole. Use a hole puncher or scissors again. Be careful, grab a doll hole if you need it. Okay. I mentioned that this type of 
the kite does need a tail. It's going to stabilize the flight. It's going to put a little weight on the bottom end to make it stand up a little bit better so that this piece catches the catches the breeze. So you could use party streamers for this if you have them. Um, we love this stuff. It's flagging tape. The size of the tail doesn't matter. Okay, so you can make really long ones if you care to, really short ones. They don't have to be all the same material. You could use ribbon. A lot of different materials you can use for this. What kind of material can you use if you don't have ribbon or party streamers? for flagging tape. In your Google Drive folder, you're going to have printables for paper helicopter, and you're also going to have paper helicopter instructions. So those will be right in that file if you care to use ours. You can go to um, Google Images and search, and there are all different types of ones. I have one with a little rabbit on it. Um, you can find different styles of these. Now, um, just cut these out on the dotted lines. Please don't cut the solid lines. The bottom is the piece with the solid lines on it. The top look like this. You're going to fold one wing forward and one wing backwards. One wing forward, one wing backwards. On the bottom, you're going to fold on the solid line, you're going to fold the sides in like that. And at this bottom solid line, you're just going to fold that up. And you're going to use one paper clip and just clip it together like that. Simple as that. So where can you drop this from that will make it spin longer? Can you drop it from a higher height? Can you imagine that air pushing against those blades? Do you notice that the blades lift up a little bit when it falls through the air? Can you imagine the air needing to get out of the way in order for this to fall down? What made it fall down anyway? It's gravity. Okay. Oh, awesome, Hannah, how did that go? <laughs> Did it spin? Um, I've got a little bunny one. I can't even tell you where I got it from. I have it for years. I had some other guy that looks like a like a World War One fighter pilot. I they're all over the place. If you don't if you don't have a printer or if your families don't have a printer, you can take just a half sheet of paper, okay, and cut a T shape. Cut a T-shape like that. I'm going to do the same thing to the top. Like that. They make a wonky little T-shape. Look, this is not, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to fold that forward and backwards, and I'm going to roll this up a little bit. Put my paper clip on, and something as simple as that will spin. Now, I did notice that I did need to um, kind of even out the weight on the sides a little bit to make it spin better. Okay, um, a note about the um, materials for the kite tail. Um, why not use a plastic shopping bag? Um, that you get at, at Walmart and cut that into strips and use for materials as well. So that would that'd be a real simple material that a lot of kids have at home in, um, that they could use to make that. Um, I recommended this book, um, Kite Flying. Uh, I love this book. It's about this little this girl who um, her family um, builds a kite together and they, they make it a dragon. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful book, I, I thought. 
this kite flying by Grace Lynn. Okay, um, so how, how are we doing with the activities? Feeling pretty good so far? This is hard to do when I can't see faces. <laughs> okay. Um, doing great. good. Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on to um, build a buggy? And um, just real quick, a reminder, if, you, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in chat and I'll make sure Lori's aware. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy, for monitoring that um, for me. Okay, so build a buggy. I suggested the most magnificent thing to go with this activity. Um, and this is why, because this child is my kindred spirit. When it comes to making things, man, this girl just gets me, okay? And let me show you why. She tried, and she tried, and she tried, didn't she? And um, <laughs> no matter how hard she tried, it just would not work. And bless her little heart, haven't you ever felt this feeling? You, you, the, more, the more frustrated you get, the bigger your hands feel, and the more um, busy your brain is and it's harder to concentrate and those thoughts just come so furiously and so fast and she um, she was having that same problem and um, but then she she crunched her finger and then she just exploded um, I love this and it says and she explodes and then it says it wasn't her finest moment <laughs> trust me I've been there when it comes to making and tinkering um, she got frustrated and quit, but then she and her assistant went for a walk. And then she started thinking about all the iterations of this magnificent thing that she had made. And she started thinking, you know, I kind of liked this part of my first try. And, and this part on my second try wasn't so bad. And, and she started taking these ideas from all these iterations, ended up putting them together and made her most magnificent thing. I loved this because it talks about the process of making things. Um, and the, it, I love the fact that it really illustrates you're not the only one who gets frustrated and things don't work out the first time every time. And that's part of engineering. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Build a Buggy video um, and see what you think. All righty. And just some comments in the um, chat. Somebody's daughter, Robin's daughter, got this book, that book for her birthday, and they just love it. It's a great book. I, I really did. I, it's a, I really enjoyed it. Okay, here comes. Welcome. To the activity is uh, an engineering design challenge. It's going to challenge kids to build a buggy out of household materials and find a way to make that buggy move. Okay. Um, the book that I'm suggesting to use with this is The Most Magnificent Thing by Ashley Spires. On the directions, I did mention that this is a self-directed activity. I really can't give you procedures or how to do it like in a step-by-step -step thing because you have to figure out what materials you're going to use to build a buggy. What do you have around your house that you could make move? Take a second to think about what kind of materials you could use for a body for wheels and axles. Any other part of the buggy that you think you might like to do? So first of all, I started with the Powerade bottle. Now I loved this Powerade bottle because the Powerade bottle has these little ridges in them. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be perfect because it's gonna allow me to line up my axle just beautifully straight. It's just gonna fit right in that little ridge thing and it's gonna fit so well and it's gonna look um, really straight. And this thing's gonna go like no other, right? I was really excited about this design. So I glued everything together. Sure enough, my wheels were just so straight and my Powerade bottle didn't move. In fact, when I tried to push it, it didn't move very well either. So I thought, well, if it's too heavy, maybe I'll use, I'll use lighter skewers for the axle. They're much lighter and, and that might work better. And I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use more heavy plastic um, wheels. Maybe those will be more stable and work better. So I, and I tried a Diet Coke bottle, right? A um, little 16 ounce Diet Coke bottle. And then I thought, I'm going to put a balloon inside the bottle and I'm going to blow up the balloon and let it go and the, the air is going to come out of the balloon and push the bottle forward. It's going to be great. And then I realized I've got to make holes in the bottle for the air inside the bottle to come out when I inflate the balloon into the bottle. That didn't work. 
Like it didn't even come close where I let it go. Then it, it didn't work. Well, Sarah came up with this design. She used a 60 ounce pot bottle. She used some bamboo skewers, some straw, and we have a bunch of these mailing tube lids. Those work really well for wheels. And she made this design, rolls really nicely. So here's our second design. Sarah and I made this. We had some little foam core around, a little foam core section. We used the same uh, bamboo skewer and straw for the, um, for the wheels and axles. We just glued these lids on. She poked a hole in the lids, pushed the skewer through, and then hot glued that inside there. We got thinking, though, we have schools. We had some wooden spools around. And I started thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could put the balloon through there and hook it here, and, and we could use the balloon to power our buggy. So our first iteration of this uh, did a wheelie way too heavy on the spool side. So it did a wheelie and traveled like this. It was awesome, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't the way we wanted it to travel. So Sarah suggested we place some weight on the ends. We started with a we started with a washer. We found that wasn't enough weight. So Sarah found some modeling clay and she put that uh, she put that right there. Oh that's a great little buggy. We were really excited when we got our idea to work. Uh, I'm really thrilled about this balloon and the way the spool holds it. I would suggest you have some kind of straight piece for the axle that connects the wheels. The wheels, what kind of materials could you use for the wheels? What about pot bottle lids? Uh, plastic water bottle lids? What about lifesavers? If you had some lifesavers around, they already have the hole in the middle. You can hot glue the straw right through there, right through those holes. Here's another thing to look out for. The axles need to spin freely. If you were to take an axle and attach it directly to the base of your body, would that axle be able to spin? If it can't spin, your wheels won't turn and you won't get any motion. Uh, so. I took my axle and I put it through a straw. It doesn't matter how big the straw is, you could make the straw very small actually. Um, you just need to make sure that the axle is longer than the straw so that um, the wheels don't get hung up on the sides of the straw. You want to make sure that the wheels can spin very freely. We used hot glue to hold this together. If you don't have hot glue, tape will work. You could use masking tape, duct tape, transparent tape will even work. What kind of materials do you think you can use for the body of the, of the buggy? I had a piece of this little foam core laying around that I used. Uh, I had some bottles that we can't return right now, so I used a bottle. I had pieces of mailing tube as well. That'd make a cool looking one. What about a plastic cup or even a Kleenex box? What about a box of macaroni? Um, once you have your macaroni and cheese, maybe you can use the empty box. I can think of lots of different things that I can use to make that buggy. Now, how are you going to make your buggy move? Remember in the introduction, we talked about Newton's first law of motion. And we said that objects at rest stay at rest. So if I take Sarah's buggy, and I just put it on the table and I leave it right there, it's not gonna move, is it? And what fun is that? I don't have a motor to propel it. I don't have anything like um, a balloon like we have on this buggy to make it move. What can I do to make that buggy move? Do you have any ideas? Okay, here in our classroom, we have these nice little ramps like this, but what do you, I don't have these ramps at home. Do you have anything that you could use to make a ramp at home? Maybe you could cut off a cardboard box uh, and have a long, flat piece of cardboard that you could prop up on some books. I'm going to go ahead and put this buggy at the top of the ramp. And I'm going to let it go. 
Uh, nice. <laughs> Can you think about the forces that are working on this buggy? What force is pulling it down the ramp? It's gravity. Gravity pulls it down the ramp. Now, we mentioned Newton's first law of motion. We said that if this bottle is just sitting here and nobody's doing anything to it, it won't move. We have to apply an outside force or an unbalanced force to make it move. The other part of that law says that objects in motion will stay in motion unless they acted on by an outside force. Now that tells me that if I let this bottle buggy go down, this ramp, it's gonna keep going and going forever and ever and ever. We know that's not true. What makes it stop? Are there forces that act on this bottle buggy that resist motion, make it slow down or stop? What about the friction between the wheel and the table? What about air resistance or drag as the buggy is moving through and pushing the air out of the way? That's creating a form of friction that slows it down. Now, this bottle will end up falling off the table. I broke it. Will end up falling off the table, hitting the ground, and it stops moving. The ground applies something called normal force. Normal force happens. Normal force is the push up from the table that counteracts the pull down from gravity. So, I broke Sarah's buggy when it fell off the table, but no big deal. I just grabbed some duct tape and fixed it. I just figured out a way to fix it. So, as I let this buggy travel down the ramp, gravity pulls it down the ramp and makes it move. Friction and air resistance slow the buggy down until it eventually stops. Got me thinking, though, as so I'm standing here, I kind of had my hands on the table, and I just, I kind of noticed that the table is very smooth. When I run my hand over it, I can barely hear it. Listen. I can barely hear it. It got me thinking about different surfaces. What do you suppose would happen if I put sandpaper at the bottom of the ramp? What do you think is going to happen? Can you make a prediction? Let's see what happens. thought it was going to slow it down more. I'm kind of surprised, actually. What do you think is going to happen if we roll this buggy over a piece of grass? Will it go as far? Will it go as fast? Oh, that didn't go very far at all, did it? The friction with this grass is so high that it quickly slows the motion of our buggy. Now, to recap this activity, uh, your engineering challenge is to design a buggy that you can make move. Now, we used a ramp to make ours move, and we used a balloon to make ours move. Can you think of any other ways that you could make it move? Use materials that you've got laying around the house. Be really creative about um, how you use materials. In the words of the Tinker Studio at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, they try to build things and design things using familiar materials in unfamiliar ways. I think that's just a great way to look at tinkering and making things. All right. Well, that was a really fun one to do, even though I broke Sarah's bottle buggy and she was not happy with me. She said, but I made it. And I said, well, I fixed it. So whatever. Um, Again, I just want to stress the fact that just use whatever you've got laying around and, and um, kind of scavenging those materials is half the fun. Um, this is a really open-ended activity that's very easy to do with kids. It's one of those ones where you um, explain the challenge, explain the criteria, what a successful project looks like, and explain the constraints, what you've got to work with in terms of materials and time. Um, clarify the challenge. Kids always have lots of questions about, well, does it count if, if it only goes this far? Or does it count if it goes really slow, but it's still moving? Um, allowing the kids to help you clarify the challenge is a great piece of this. Um, and then you um, 
let them have it and step out of the way. It's one of those fantastic STEM projects where um, you go up to the kid and say, um, do you need any help? And they say, no, I'm good. And you spend your time leaning against the wall looking for something to do. Those are the best kinds of activities for me. I love it when kids take them away from me. All right, um, we've got one more video um, for gravity races. So let's take a quick look at that because I know we only have about 15 minutes left. So let's take a quick look at that and then we'll spend the last few minutes catching any um, questions, uh, any clarifications if I can make any. Kathy, how are we doing with the chat box? Are we all right? Yeah, everyone's loving it. Lots oh, of really? great ideas on what they can use around the house. Fantastic. Yep. It's really fun to think about the stuff that you have. It, it, this in some ways has been a really good challenge. Um, it's been very difficult to think about how to take these activities that need to be hands on and, and get them to kids when you don't know what they've got to work with. So anyway, okay, let me get this uh, next activity for us. Why can I never find it? I put it right where I wanted it to be. <laughs> Sorry. And while you're looking at that, Lori, we did have a question about using your videos and your handouts um, okay. for their libraries. Sure. Um, yeah, do feel free to, um, good heavens, what have I done? <laughs> um, here it is. Um, do feel free to use those um, uh, those sheets. They're there for you to use. Um, if you'd like to use the YouTube videos, feel free. The links are right there if you need them. Um, I would encourage you to make your own only because I really, really hate making YouTube videos as it turns out. I mean, it's just the worst, but um, you know, feel free to use them if you find that they're helpful and feel free to use this information to make your own. I'm sure your families are missing you too and want to see your faces. Um, really quickly, one of the things I like about these activities that um, I pulled for this is that um, I thought they were ones that we could do virtually this way in this format. However, when we get back to the point where we can start seeing each other face to face, if we have to limit the number of people that we can allow into our institutions, this is these are the types of, act of activities that you can put out on a table and do um, with good station instructions or with somebody there to help out. Um, you know, one on one, or you can do them in, in full group too. Um, they're just, um, they're really easy to um, format in a way that's useful. All right, so here goes the next video. And for whatever reason, I linked it where it um, doesn't start at the beginning. I'm sorry about that. I don't know how I managed to do that one. So what I'm using for this one is called I Fall Down by Vicki Cobb. It's a great book because it's not meant to be read through like a storybook. This book asks you questions and challenges you to test out your ideas. So for example, it says, you can see how gravity pulls, take a spoonful of molasses or honey and point the spoon down so that the goo dribbles back into the jar. Watch it drip. And it invites you to wonder, do some things fall faster than others? Have you ever tried that? Seems to me that things that are heavier should probably fall faster. At least that's what I thought. Look at these two objects. I have a ping pong ball and I have a lump of clay. The ping pong ball is quite light. You can see that when I put it on the scale, it weighs 2.6 grams. When I put the modeling clay on there, it's 41.7 grams. This clay is much heavier than the ping pong ball. So my question to you is which one's gonna hit the ground first when I drop it? Now, when I drop it, I need to make sure that they're about the same height. I wanna get them as close to the same height as I possibly can. I also wanna make sure that I drop the objects at the same time. It's kind of tricky sometimes. You may have to try a few times to get it just right. So, have you made your prediction? Which one's gonna hit the ground first? Here we go. Three, two, one, drop it. Did you see that? Let's try again. Did the clay hit the ground first? Did the ping pong ball hit the ground first? Or did they hit the ground at the same time? Well, if I did this right, and they were at the same height, and I dropped them at the same time, they hit the ground at the same time. Everything falls at the same rate. OK, 
okay, regardless of the weight, everything falls at the same rate. So, what about my car keys? Remember this was about two ounces, two grams. My car keys are 137.9 grams. They're quite heavy, let's see. Did you make your prediction? Here we go. Again, they hit the ground just about the same time. same rate. Let's test and see. Will the paper ball hit at the same time as the shoe? Yeah. What's so different about that sheet of paper? What do you think? Remember when we made the kites and we were using that word air resistance? We thought about it while our buggies were rolling down the ramp and rolling through the air too. Air resistance. All the air under this paper has to get out of the way in order for the paper to go down. Gravity's still pulling on it. It's pulling at the same rate that it's pulling this paper. But in order for this, all of this air underneath here has to get out of the way as opposed to this little bit of air here. If you're having a hard time figuring out which object hits first or if they're hitting at the same time, there are a couple of ways that you can, um, you can watch them. First of all, if you have access to an iPad or a tablet or um, a smartphone, you may have a function that lets you take slow motion video. If you can take slow motion video, it's a lot easier to see when it hits the ground and whether or not you let it go at the same time um, and at the same height. Here's another trick. If you're having problems, take a cookie sheet and cover it with aluminum foil. It's covered up like this. There's about that much space between the top of the aluminum foil and the bottom of the cookie tray. Let's see, what shall we use? Let's use the clay and the marble. Get ready to listen. Did you hear it hit the aluminum, the aluminum foil at the same time? It didn't, it didn't sound like rattle, did it? It hit both at the same time, and I can hear this. Okay, so, cookie sheets got me thinking. So I was cooking dinner the other night. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I can't cook. Anyway, I got to about this cookie sheet. And in my refrigerator, I had some ketchup, and I have some mustard, and I have some mayonnaise in a little squeezy bottle. And I started thinking, what if I put like a little splat right here of ketchup, and a little splat right here, maybe a quarter size, size of a quarter of mustard. And I'm gonna put some mayonnaise right next to it. All about the same size. So, on the short edge of the pan, I have some ketchup, some mustard, and some mayonnaise. Can you think of any other materials in your refrigerator that would have this consistency? We had some sour cream in a squeezy bottle, maybe even some jelly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this up on its edge and we're gonna have a condiment race. We're gonna see which one moves the most quickly. What force is gonna pull this down? Gravity will pull it down towards the table. Are there any other forces that are resisting motion? What about the consistency of the condiment and the surface of the of the cookie sheet. I wonder what other materials that I could test with this. Do you have any paints at home, like water, um, like uh, finger paints or temper paint? Do you think you could water paint down and make them move at different rates? How could you do that? Do you think you could make artwork that way? So in the book, I Fall Down, 
The author suggests that you try lots of things and let them drop into your hand. And soon you'll discover that some things hit your hand harder than others. And she suggests that you use a bar of soap and a sponge, that you can use anything that you can find around the house. When you, when you drop those things into your hand, can you feel a difference? One feels heavier than the other, than the other does. Gravity is still pulling down. For example, if I take this piece of clay and I drop it in my hand, I can still feel that weight because gravity is still pulling down on that piece of clay. Okay, so I've got two different shoes here. One belongs to me and one belongs to Sawyer. Sawyer is a lot shorter than me. So these shoes aren't the same weight, are they? This one's pretty small and this one's pretty big. If I take these and I've attached rubber bands to them, same rubber bands, same size. If I take these and I lift up on the rubber bands, what do you think is going to happen to the rubber bands when I start to pull the shoes up by them? Do you think they'll stay the same size? Or do you think they'll change? What do you think is going to make them stretch? Watch what happens when I lift them up. Can you see the rubber band that's attached to my shoe? Look at how much it's stretched. I have a big heavy shoe. Sawyer's rubber band barely stretched at all. Gravity is still pulling down on those two objects, and it's making that rubber band stretch out on mine that's heavier. The heavier the shoe, the farther the rubber band stretches. Can you make a prediction? What about Sarah's croc? I know, stop laughing, it's a croc. What about Sarah's croc? It's a pretty big shoe, I mean, she's got big feet. Uh, what's going to happen to the rubber band when I stretch it, when I let it go? Oh, that barely moved at all. Does that give you an idea how heavy this shoe might be? Do you think it'd be heavier or lighter than my black one? It's a lot lighter, isn't it? That rubber band barely stretches at all. In fact, I almost think the Sawyer's little shoe might be a little bit heavier than this one. was a fun one to do because I harassed my child. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> again, just using stuff that we can find around the house and thinking about how things fall. Um, a word of warning, if you choose to drop it off the balcony, um, the, the upstairs balcony from your house, we need to be, you know, incredibly careful about what we're standing on. Um, I, um, tease my staff all the time when I catch them on chairs dropping things or trying to get things off the top. If I ask them if it's an OSHA approved chair. Um, so you gotta be really careful. <laughs> um, again, with the kite flying, make sure that uh, when you're running with that kite, you've ch checked the area and you're not gonna trip over anything um, or um, run into any kind of power lines or stuff. So of course, safety is really important to stress as you're doing these activities. Okay, my clock puts it at 10.58. Wow, <laughs> that went really fast. Um, are there any last minute questions? Are there clarifications that I can make before we um, finish? I do have a few questions for you too. Yeah, uh, hey Lori, uh, sure. I have a quick question. Can you tell everyone about STAR? What S-T-A-R stands for behind you there? Absolutely, um, so in our classrooms we have um, and this is probably going to look backwards too, but we have these posters around STAR. And STAR is based on the PBIS model, um, positive behavior and intervention supports. And um, what it is, is a way to um, set culture in your school or your library or, or our institution. Um, it's shared expectations for the way we are here. And STAR, the S stands for safety first. Everything we do, we put safety first. T stands for take responsibility for the things that I say and the things that I do. A stands for actions have consequences. What I choose to do affects everyone else in my group. And R, respect, respect yourself and others. When we come together, we're joining a community of learners. And as such, we speak to each other the way learners do. And um, that's a supportive way, and it's a way that moves everyone in our group forward. Um, every activity that we do here at the Planetarium and at Sloan Museum starts with STAR. 
um, in our summer programs, the kids that come to see us again and again all summer, by August, they're going, safety first, take responsibility, because they've heard it 17 times. I don't care, you're going to hear it again. Um, this is just the way we live. And, and we always make sure that the kids understand that um, it's not just an expectation for their behavior, that they have every right to expect that anyone Grown-ups, chaperones, teachers, staff here are going to be living by these same expectations. It's just who we are. Um, it's been a really, really great tool for us over the past several years. Um, I, I'd highly recommend using something like this. Um, feel free to use STAR if you want to um, or make your own. Um, interesting to think what book might be. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I always sure. love that. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions in chat. Nobody has a question. What I can really see, um, Lori, is libraries being able to take these and break them down into um, small STEM segments to spread throughout a week or, a, or the month. Um, lots of great ways to adapt it, whether we're doing virtual programming this summer, in-person programming, um, you know, making kits to send home to families um is that something you know, your that's handouts? going to be an option because yeah. we're thinking about how best to uh to to do our library programming this summer um our thought right now and i wanted to try this format first but our thought right now is to develop something along this line um with the short youtube video demonstrations but um sending along to the library packets of material um, that kids could perhaps pick up from the library, take home, and then do along with the videos. Is that something that's useful? Um, we're really struggling trying to figure out what the best way to attack this is. Yeah, I think so. I saw some nods of agreement there. Okay. Um, um, yeah, like... Have, I'm sorry, Kathy, you do have my contact information in um, uh, on the web, uh, the YouTube links. Um, so... Oh. Please feel free to reach out if you've got any ideas or have any ways that you can say, Lori, it'd be really helpful if you could do this. I am desperate for your advice. <laughs> um, and as far as the survey goes that Kathy attached, the kindest thing you can do is, is to be honest. So please let us know if there's um, anything that I can do as we continue through this um, to improve how we're doing these things. Yes, thank you, Lori. And I think for your first uh, webinar of kind of train the trainer this has been fantastic wonderful that's good news i was worried yeah <laughs> no to the one in a few weeks i'll start working on that now yeah stem in the kitchen and i see some comments in the chat with some great ideas on how to link this to the imagine your story summer reading program wonderful. like cinderella's royal carriage Ooh, um, ping pong drop becomes humpty dumpty so lots of ways you can put the imagine your story twist on this too great so please take some time to fill out the survey. Um, the link's in the chat box, or you can see it up on your screen right now. And Lori, we thank you so much. My really pleasure. It was so nice touching base with everybody. I hope everybody's well and stays that way. Yes. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.